So in the lab, you got to palpate some muscles. Hopefully you um, looked at their origins and insertions and you have your lab manual that's got that muscle list in it. Um, so the ankle muscles are great because they're really well organized. Um, they are, they're in nice neat groups that all get the same innervation and all have similar primary actions. Um, so hopefully they'll be easy for you to remember and we'll go through each of those groups. We'll talk about some of the functional considerations, which I hope you saw some of in lab as well. So um, we're going to classify the muscles of the lower extremity, the distal lower extremity, as intrinsic or extrinsic. And we're going to do the same on the upper extremity. So we have a similar setup on the upper extremity. So intrinsic muscles have both proximal and distal attachments within the foot. So um, they're shorter, smaller ones, and they do things inside the foot. Extrinsic muscles have proximal attachments within the lower leg or distal femur, like the gastrocnemius, and distal attachments within the foot. So the muscles of the ankle and foot provide static control, dynamic thrust, and shock absorption to the distal lower extremity. So um, the dynamic thrust mostly comes in gait. Um, that control for adjusting to ground surfaces, very important functions of the foot and ankle complex. And shock absorption. So we'll talk about how some of the muscles act eccentrically to slow down motions and absorb some of the shock that um, comes when we're walking or jumping or running or all that great stuff that we like to do with our feet and ankles. So the innervation of the um, extrinsic muscles of the ankle and foot is quite clear cut and easy to remember, which is lovely. Um, the extrinsic muscles are arranged into anterior, lateral, and posterior compartments. And um, so there's uh, four muscles in the anterior, two in the lateral, three in the um, deep posterior, and three in the superficial posterior compartment. So um, very nicely organized. Each compartment is innervated by either the tibial nerve or the common peroneal nerve, which they both arise from the sciatic nerve. So that makes it pretty easy in terms of nerve roots um, and that sort of thing because um, it's all the same nerve roots. Yay. So the tibial nerve, it, after it passes the knee, it, it continues distally through the lower leg. And so um, the tibial nerve innervates a lot of the um, superficial posterior group. Um, the common peroneal nerve courses laterally and wraps around the fibular head and splits into superficial peroneal and deep peroneal nerves. And um, they get most of the lateral and anterior um, muscles innervated. So the tibial nerve, as it continues into the foot, it bifurcates into medial and lateral plantar nerves. And those innervate all of the intrinsic muscles of the foot, except one extensor digitorum brevis, which gets a deep branch of the peroneal nerve. I am not going to expect you to memorize the, um, the names, the origins and insertions, or the innervation of the intrinsic muscles of the foot. Um, foot therapy is considered a specialty area, much like hand therapy. And um, it's, not, it's not entry level to do foot or hand therapy. So it's, if it's an area of interest to you, it's certainly a great um, area for continuing ed. Um, I work in a clinic with a foot and ankle specialist, and, um, and then also uh, I work with a lot of neurological patients where foot and ankle muscles really come into play. So I get to work with a lot of feet, and um, I love working with feet. It's really uh, fun and interesting and uh, very functional for the person you're working with. So the anterior compartment muscles include the tibialis anterior, extensor digitorum longus, extensor hallucis longus, and the peroneus tertius. Of course, there are always those little muscles that are kind of freaks. Um, peroneus tertius, really, it should have been with the peroneus group, but it's not. <laughs> it, um, unlike the peroneus group, it courses anteriorly, anterior to the medial lateral axis, and so it does um, dorsiflexion like the rest of the anterior compartment muscles, so it's included with them. And it also shares innervation. So all of these muscles originate on the anterior and lateral aspects of the proximal tibia and adjacent fibula in the interosseous membrane. And all four are innervated by the deep peroneal nerve. And all four, because they course anteriorly 
to the medial lateral axis and they primarily have a vertical line of pull, they perform dorsiflexion as one of their primary actions. So this, in this picture, um, the tibialis anterior is pictured. It's sort of the, you can think of it as being the primary um, dorsiflexor and inverter of the foot and ankle. Um, it originates on the proximal two-thirds of the lateral surface of the tibia and the interosseous membrane. Um, and it courses um, anteriorly to the medial malleolus, anteriorly to the medial lateral axis. Um, comes around the medial side of the foot and attaches to the, uh, the medial cuneiform or the first cuneiform, the medial and the plantar surfaces and the base of the first metatarsal. So because it attaches um, on the plantar surface, it gives it that line of pull for inversion and it has a slight lateral to medial um, line and so it has that line of pull for inversion. So it is the, the major um, dorsiflexor and inverter um, of the ankle and foot, and it gets the deep peroneal nerve. So um, the other three in the group are um, pictured here. The, on the left, the extensor halsus longus, it's deep between the tibialis anterior and the extensor digitoris um, longus. It um, is on the medial, on the middle anterior surface of the fibula and interosseous membrane, so it's a little bit lateral. Um, and its insertion is the dorsal base of the distal phalanx of the first toe. So it's on the, um, on the dorsal side. So it has a tiny line of pull for inversion. So I put inversion question mark on the muscle list. Um, just because of that lateral to medial line of pull. But it's not a major player in inversion. Um, it's big action that nobody else does is it extends the first toe the first metatarsal um, phalangeal jo joint and the first interphalangeal joint. Um, and then it's also the tibialis anterior's uh, little helper in dorsiflexion and gets the deep peroneal nerve. So extensor digitorum longus is the most lateral of the um, anterior compartment muscles, um, the most proximal and lateral, and um, it originates on the lateral condyle of the tibia and the proximal anterior medial shaft of the fibula in the interosseous membrane. And it splits into four tendons that then attach to the dorsal surface of the proximal base of the middle and distal phalanges of the second through fifth toes. So it does extension for all but the big toe. Um, so it extends those, those uh, toes two through five, all of the joints the um, metatarsal phalangeal joints, the proximal interphalangeal joints, and the distal interphalangeal joints. Um, and because it courses anterior to the medial lateral axis and it has that vertical line of pull, it does dorsiflexion. Um, it has the, the attachments on the lateral side of the foot give it a little bit of a line of pull for eversion. So when you look at this picture, you can see that most of its attachments are a little more lateral um, just like the halsus is a little more medial, so it does have a, a slight line of pull for eversion and it gets the deep peroneal nerve. So the peroneus tertius, it's, um, we have a few muscles in our body that not everybody has. So there's, um, there's one in the upper extremity, one in the lower extremity. The peroneus tertius is the one that's not present in all people. And the last thing I read said 10% of the population doesn't have a peroneus tertius. And in the case of the people that don't have it, um, it's not a defect or anything. It's just that those muscle fibers have merged with some of the other peroneal muscles and they don't have that distal attachment. So obviously it's not super important. It doesn't affect your function at all. Um, it originates on the distal third of the medial surface of the fibula and the adjacent interosseous membrane. And it inserts on the dorsal surface of the base of the fifth metatarsal. So you can see that it has the line of pull for dorsiflexion like the others in the group running anterior to the medial lateral axis. And because it's lateral, it also has that slight line of pull for eversion if you have it. But obviously we have other muscles that do eversion and dorsiflexion, so it's not a super important um, one of the group. And it gets the deep peroneal. So um, 
just knowing the group and its innervation and its major actions, um, that gives you a lot. And then you can look at the origin insertion and see what the likely um, accessory actions are for each muscle. So um, the, there are a couple of different um, categories that, um, that are signs of weakness of the dorsiflexor muscles. So foot drop versus foot slap, they talk about in the book. Um, so they really, the dorsiflexors have two important functions during gait. So during the swing phase, the dorsiflexors have to contract concentrically to elevate the foot to clear the ground. Um, so between, um, in, er, in the early stance phase between the heel contact and the foot flat, the dorsiflexors have to activate eccentrically to slowly lower the sole of the foot to the ground so it doesn't slap down. So any, an injury um, to the deep peroneal nerve can cause problems with the dorsiflexor muscles and weakness of the muscle group can um, impair your walking, basically. So foot drop um, is where the foot drops into plantar flexion as the legs advance during the swing phase of gait. And um, a lot of times in order to keep the foot from dragging, someone is uh, forced to adopt a high stepping gait. So they they have to pick their knee up like the guy on the left side of this picture is doing, um, like they're stepping over an imaginary obstacle um, in order to clear their toes so they don't trip on them. So um, a lot of times if somebody has foot drop, they will um, be prescribed an ankle foot orthosis, which is the picture on the right there. Um, and that helps keep their toes up as they advance during swing phase. So the dorsiflexors can't do it, they need a little bit of help. So sometimes people after a, um, a neurological problem or a nerve injury, a peripheral nerve injury, they need um, an AFO temporarily until those, the nerves come back um, and heal. Some people end up needing one permanently. So um, that is an intervention that we often um, see in physical therapy. Usually the, um, the therapist recommends it and then the doctor prescribes it and then they go to a, a prosthetic orthotic specialist to um, get a custom one. There are also off-the-shelf AFOs that you can try out and sometimes we'll try out an off-the-shelf AFO with someone and, and we find that it's helpful for them and then we'll get a, a permanent uh, custom fit one prescribed for them. So the other, um, the eccentric um, issue is if the dorsiflexors can't generate sufficient eccentric activation between the heel touching ground and the foot going to flat, and the forefoot slaps down. It's called foot slap because it makes a slapping sound as the sole of the foot is dropped to the ground, basically. And um, so, both of these conditions are, are associated with weakness of the dorsiflectors um, and they're often treated by strengthening those uh, muscles. The, um, depending on what the cause is, um, you might need the AFO. Um, you also might uh, want to avoid a plantar flexion contracture um, by using the AFO until you can strengthen the muscle. So um, a lot of times um, you can use electrical stim to strengthen the muscle, you can do um, neuromuscular facilitation, you can do just, um, if they have good movement, you can just do plain old strengthening exercises, which, hey, those are great, we love them. So um, shin splints are another condition that um, affect that uh, same muscle group. So a lot of times, um, it's either the medial or posterior um, sides of the tibia that are affected, the muscles that attach to the medial or posterior sides. Um, and often the dorsiflexors are the, um, the guys that are involved in here. So um, if the dorsiflexor, dorsiflexors are untrained, in other words, maybe you're doing a new activity that you hadn't done before, um, and the, the dorsiflexors flexors are having to take up the slack, um, a lot of times they become inflamed through overuse. So um, there are a lot of 
there are a lot of different pathologies that are called shin splints. Um, during uh, running, dorsiflectors have to go quickly from um, concentric to eccentric activation, so that can cause an overuse injury. Um, excessive pronation of the foot during running or walking can exacerbate or contribute to shin splints. Um, so a lot of times that's when um, a therapist might recommend orthotics um, to help support the foot and um, provide relief to the inflamed dorsiflexors. So sometimes it can be something as simple as an over-the-counter, like a super feet orthotic or something like that. And sometimes if someone has um, excessive motion, they might need a custom orthotic. Or if they have some, mis um, some alignment issues, they might need a cu custom orthotic. Besides orthotic, um, we're also doing other anti-inflammatory treatments to reduce the inflammation. Rest, ice, ultrasound. Um, sometimes we use uh, kinesio tape or other types of therapeutic taping either to support the arch or to um, unload the muscles. And, um, and then, of course, once the inflammation slows down, then we want to work on strengthening. And functional strengthening is really important. So the next compartment is the lateral compartment. And so um, there are two muscles in the lateral compartment. The um, pronus tertius wanted to be in the lateral compartment, but it just didn't make the grade because it didn't have the right line of pull. <clears throat> so the, two, the other two both have peroneus in their name. That makes it easy to remember. Um, the proximal attachment is the lateral condyle of the tibia. Um, and two-thirds of the lateral surface of the fibula. So there's, the peroneus longus has a pretty big muscle belly. You can palpate it on most people. Um, the distal attachment is the lateral surface of the medial cuneiform and the base of the first metatarsal. Okay, doesn't that sound familiar? Let's flip back a couple slides to the um, tibialis anterior. It inserted on the medial side of the um, cuneiforms and the base of the first metatarsal. So the tibialis anterior goes around medially, the peroneus longus goes around laterally, and they join together on the plantar surface of the foot to form what we refer to as the stirrup of the foot. So it's some help in um, supporting the arch, and we'll, we'll talk about that um, in a little bit. So um, it has that great line of pull for eversion. It's on the lateral side, it wraps underneath and attaches to the medial side of the foot. Uh, medial side of the plantar surface of the foot so it can pull you into eversion. Because the tendon runs posterior to the lateral malleolus, it also has a line of pull for plantar flexion because it runs posterior to the medial lateral axis. So those malleoli are great markers for that medial lateral axis. So it's one of our primary um, everters and, um, and it's a big player in plantar flexion as well. Plus it helps with the balance of the foot um, forming that stirrup with the tibialis anterior. So if somebody asks you what are the two muscles that make up the stirrup of the foot, you know that it's the peroneus longus and the tibialis anterior. The other muscle in the um, lateral compartment is the peroneus brevis. It's deep to the longus, it's, it's shorter, and it attaches just to the distal two-thirds of the lateral surface of the fibula. It has the same line of pull as the um, peroneus longus, its insertion is on the styloid process, or the tuberosity of the fifth metatarsal, which hopefully you got to palpate in lab. So um, it assists a little bit with plantar flexion because it's got that posterior to the medial lateral axis line of pull, just like the peroneus longus. And it, um, its main job is ankle eversion. Okay, so it also gets the superficial peroneal nerve. So peroneus longus and peroneus brevis get superficial peroneal nerve. So um, the lateral compartment muscles, they provide an important element of muscular stability to the lateral aspect of the ankle and foot. So if you have weak peroneal muscles, the foot is more likely to flip into strong inversion, possibly resulting in a lateral ankle sprain. Or if you have um, peroneal tendon issues, sometimes you'll get subluxation of the peroneal tendons where they pop up, they you get connective tissue injuries and they um, pop over the malleolus, well then they don't have their line of pull for plantar flexion anymore 
And um, their E version is much weaker because they, they don't have that pulley to um, magnify the force. And so then they're more likely to flip into inversion and resulting in that lateral ankle sprain. So you can see, oh, that looks painful, the soccer player. <laughs> so the, po the superficial posterior group includes the gastrocnemius, the soleus, and the plantaris. So um, all three of these muscles are innervated by the tibial nerve, and they all three perform a combination of plantar flexion and inversion. So plantar flexion and inversion sounds like supination, right? <laughs> so these guys are player, players in supination. So um, well, we'll talk about the, deep, uh, the superficial group and then the deep group. So the gastroc is the only one that um, crosses the knee and the ankle of this group. I, I'm sorry, the plantaris does too, but come on. It's, it's, it's tiny. It's not doing anything. So the, the gastroc attaches to the medial and lateral um, femoral condyles, the posterior aspects of each. It inserts on the calcaneal tuberosity via the Achilles tendon. Um, it shares the Achilles tendon with the soleus. Um, it does knee flexion because it, it crosses um, uh, posterior to the knee, um, medial lateral axis, and it can perform that knee flexion. And it also goes posterior to the medial lateral axis of the ankle, and it's a plantar flexor. It's one of our prime plantar flexors. It's our power muscle for jumping and running and all that good stuff that we can do with our feet and ankles. Um, it gets the tibial nerve. The soleus is deep to the gastroc and its um, origin is the proximal, it's the, the um, single joint plantar flexor at the ankle. So the, the gastroc is the two joint uh, multi-articular muscle, the soleus is the um, monoarticular muscle. So its origin is the proximal posterior surface of the tibia and the proximal third of the posterior fibula and fibular head. So it has a pretty wide attachment. And it shares the Achilles tendon with the gastroc and attaches to the calcaneal tuberosity via that tendon. Um, it does ankle plantar flexion. It's pretty, it has a pretty straight down line of pull and um, has that tibial nerve. So the plantar, tiny little plantaris does not contribute very much to the whole business. Um, it inserts on the lateral supracondylar line of the femur. So um, that's, what, that's where um, you get that tiny little bit of inversion um, because it has that lateral to medial line, but really not a big player. It's a tiny little muscle with a really long tendon. <clears throat> And so it's a weak assistant in knee flexion and a weak assistant in ankle plantar flexion and very little contribution to, um, um, you know, I'm not running down the plantaris or anything, but it's just really, when you have big muscles, the big muscles are going to do a lot of the work. Um, so it doesn't really, because it's long, it doesn't really provide a lot of stabilization either. Um, and it gets the tibial nerve. So... The deep posterior group <clears throat> includes tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum longus, and flexor halsus longus, and um, their nicknames are Tom, Dick, and Harry. Tom for tibialis, Dick for digitorum, and Harry for halsus. So um, these guys are the muscles that wrap around the medial um, malleolus, and um, they... Um, We'll talk about their individual actions, but they're all innervated by the tibial nerve, just like the other posterior muscles, and they perform a combination of plantar flexion and inversion. So these guys are supinators. So a muscle that is a supinator, it is a it um, controls pronation eccentrically. So these muscles are very important, particularly the tibialis posterior, very important for controlling pronation. Um, eccentrically as we roll onto the first metatarsal um, it, during gait. So um, big players in um, control when we're, um, when we're performing that normal pronation as we go from the heel to the toe and then push off the toe, these muscles um, act to control dorsiflexion and 
inversion and um, I mean they uh, act to control dorsiflexion, eversion, um, and abduction, which is pronation, eccentrically. Okay, so um, a tibialis posterior, it's the deepest of the posterior muscles. You can actually palpate it right on the edge of the tibia. You can't palpate the whole belly, belly, but you can get your fingers right in there. People don't like it when you dig on their tibialis posterior because it's pretty tender, but um, sometimes you got to get in there. Um, so it's, it's the deepest. It controls pronation eccentrically. Um, its origin is the proximal posterior shafts of, shaft of the tibia and fibula and the interosseous membrane. So that interosseous membrane is an important attachment for a lot of these muscles. Um, it has multiple attachments on the um, plantar surface of the foot. Um, it attaches to every tarsal bone except the talus. It also attaches to the bases of the second, third, and fourth metatarsals and the navicular tuberosity. So broad um, attachments on the foot, um, so it, it provides a lot of control. The flexor halsus longus, it starts laterally and it loops medially at the malleolus. Um, so it, its, its origin is on the middle half of the posterior fibula and the plantar, the insertions on the plantar surface of the base of the distal phalanx of the first toe. So it does that first toe flexion, flexor halsus longus. Halsus means big toe, longus means it's a long muscle, and flexor means it flexes the big toe. So um, flexing the first toe is its main job. It also does inversion because it's got that medial to uh, or lateral to medial line of pull. And it's a weak plantar flexor because it has that line of pull that's posterior to the medial lateral axis. So it can do that plantar flexion. Um, and it gets the tibial nerve just like everybody else in the group. Um, flexor digitorum longus is the other guy in the group. Um, it's Origin is the middle posterior surface of the tibia. So it is um, the flexor digitorum longus and the flexor halicis longus um, are to one side or the other of the tibialis posterior. And these are the three guys that wrap around that medial malleolus. Um, so the, it inserts, just like the extensor digitorum, um, it separates into four separate tendons and it goes to the bases of the distal phalanges of the second through fifth toes. So um, it flexes those last four toes. It has a little bit of a line of pull for inversion because it goes around that malleolus and ducks under the foot. Um, <clears throat> and um, it is a weak assist on plantar flexion. Um, and it gets the tibial nerve. So a lot of these groupings, they have um, similar origins and in, in insertions and similar actions, and they, they share innervation. So the soleus versus the gastroc, um, the soleus is primarily composed of um, slow twitch fibers best equipped for standing or controlling postural sway, which is a big function of our ankles. Um, the gastroc, is uh, fast twitch, jumping, sprinting, running muscles. So in the picture, this young lady is um, stretching her gastroc in picture A because her knee is extended and her ankle is dorsiflexed. In picture B, we took the gastroc out of it by flexing the knee and we're stretching the soleus. So it's always nice to teach people to stretch both. So. Raising up on toes is largely due to the mechanical advantage of the plantar flexors during this action. So we talked about this as being a second class lever system, providing a mechanical system that favors strength over speed and range of motion. So um, in a second class lever system, it's ARF, it's the dog, um, the axis is um, on one side, the resistance is in the middle and the force is at the end, so ARF. So our axis is our um, first metacarpophalangeal joint. The load or the resistance is the body weight going right through the middle there. And the plantar flexors are the force pulling up.
Okay, so hopefully I'm going over this in lab. Hopefully this makes sense to you now. And if it doesn't, please post that to Ask Loretta and we will talk about it again. Because um, we, can, we can go over and over these things until they make sense to you. That's what I really want to do because I want you to get this clear in your mind. So um, we have for the medial longitudinal arch, we have some non-contractile, so non-muscular supporting structures um, that we talked about in the last section. So um, the, the plantar fascia and the bone structure and everything. So the connective tissue supporting structures can get overstretched and that can lead to excessive pronation or pes planus, which is a dropped arch or flattened arch. So the muscles of the deep posterior compartment can contract concentrically to help support the medial longitudinal arch. Um, they also contract eccentrically to help control that um, pronation to slow it down as you're um, rolling through the foot during gait. So they can be work concentrically to support the arch statically and then they can work eccentrically to slow down the rate of pronation as you accept weight onto the foot. So the intrinsic muscles, we're not going to look at all their individual names and origins and insertions, but just know that they originate and insert within the foot and are largely responsible for the actions of the toes. So um, as a group, the muscles stabilize the foot during the push-off phase of walking or running. So a lot of times when we're rehabbing someone uh, with a foot or ankle injury, we're working on intrinsic muscles by doing things like um, toe curls, curling up a towel with toes, towel scrunchies I like to call them, um, picking things up with your toes like picking up marbles or um, picking up chess pieces, um, whatever, you know, whatever you use in your clinic. If, if it's a little more difficult for people to pick up something like a marble, you can have little bits of sponge and have them pick those up and thereby working those intrinsic muscles. So the structure of the ankle and foot is designed to absorb the impact of weight bearing and adapt to the shape of the ground. So dysfunctions of the hip, knee, or low back even can be associated with problems originating at the ankle or foot. So um, a lot of times someone's having back pain or someone's having hip problems or knee problems, um, we will um, send them to our orthotic specialist to, if we feel that they need it, to get an orthotic to help take the pressure off that hip or knee or back. Um, sometimes if somebody has a leg length discrepancy, um, having a, a lift in one side or an orthotic in one side can really change the mechanics of their hip or knee or low back and um, for the better. So um, you definitely have to look at the whole kinetic chain and the ankle is the base of it.